Good morning. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. This week we are talking about 1 John 1 9 and the question about whether this is for Christians and if Christians should confess their sins. As I said yesterday, there are now major conferences across the United States talking about 1 John 1 9. Is it for Christians or is it not for Christians to confess their sins? Well, I just attended one of those conferences and our spiritual fathers, mature, seasoned veterans of the faith have been teaching the foundational doctrines of Christianity and the doctrines of the word of God, the Bible, bringing out in scripture where confession of sin is for Christians to do. And so I was giving you proofs that first John one nine is for the church. All of first John chapter one, all of the book of first John is for Christians. Paul is not writing to sinners or to Gnostics. He says, my dear children, and he's writing to the believers. He used personal pronouns, including himself in every statement he made about confession and, and, um, all through chapter one. And as we talked about yesterday, the word repent, which includes confession, confession is the first part The first step of repentance, repentance is first, confess means admit it, admit it. Repentance is a three step process. One, you admit it. Two, you feel godly sorrow or remorse. And three, you turn your and change your ways. You turn around and change your ways. And 80% of the time that the word repent is used in the Bible In scripture, it is speaking to the righteous or to the believers, not to the sinners, not to the wicked and the ungodly. And so we saw that confession of sin was also in Proverbs 28, 13. Yesterday we read, he who conceals his sins does not prosper. That's covering it up and brushing it under the rug, pretending it doesn't exist. He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. If you confess it and renounce it, you will receive mercy. Also, Psalm 32, 5, the psalmist said, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. He did not brush it under the rug. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. The psalmist was a righteous man. Yes, it's Old Testament, but the Old Testament saints were righteous by faith. Remember, Romans 4 talks about Abraham, that his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Well, it's the same with all the Old Testament saints. Those who honored God and feared the Lord, they were righteous through faith. And then we saw in Acts 19, and this is so important, in Acts chapter 19, verses 17 and 18, this just follows when the seven sons of Sceva tried to cast out a demon, and the demon jumped on them, and they ran away bleeding and naked. And it says in verse 17 and 18, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. Now that is the fear of the Lord. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. What was the result? Verse 18. Verse 18 says, many of those who believed, who believed, who believed, these are the Christians who believed, now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. So what do we see here? Revival flushed out the sinfulness of the carnal Christians and moved them to openly confess their sinfulness and their evil deeds. What does that mean? When the fear of the Lord comes upon a person and they hold the name of the Lord Jesus in high honor, you can no longer brush sin under the rug. You can no longer conceal sin. Sin must be openly confessed. In other words, if you brush your sin under the rug and go on pretending it doesn't exist, then you do not have the fear of the Lord and you are not holding the name of the Lord Jesus in high honor because this will automatically be the result. When the fear of the Lord is in a person's heart, they confess sin. You cannot have fear of God in your heart and the fear of the Lord and hide or conceal or ignore the sin in your life. 
That is so important. That's why we pray for revival in America. Revival in the churches, first of all, because there, where there is sin in the church, it needs to not be concealed and not be brushed under the rug anymore. It needs to be brought out and openly confessed and renounced. That means get rid of it. Turn away from sin and follow the Lord. And so we saw that um, that was, again, another evidence that confession of sin is for the church. It, the church needs to be confessing sin. In other words, if they don't, if a Christian doesn't, and I'll get to this in a moment. If you, I'll mention it here and I'll come back to it. But if you don't confess your sin, you're going into more darkness. I'll get there in a minute. But let me look at, we also yesterday talked about fellowship in chapter one of first John chapter one, first John chapter one, John is talking about fellowship, fellowship with the father, fellowship with the son and fellowship with each other. The word fellowship is used four times in chapter one in first John one, three, he said, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and his son, Jesus Christ. And verses six and seven, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son purifies us from all sin. When he's talking about fellowship, he's talking to believers. He's talking to the children of God because sinners do not have fellowship with the father and son. Sinners do not have fellowship with the father and the son. So he has to be talking to the church. This is in chapter one. He's talking about our fellowship with the father, our fellowship with his son, our fellowship with one another. He cannot be talking to the unbelievers because unbelievers and sinners do not have fellowship with God or with the church. And we pointed out relationship and fellowship are not the same relationship. When you sin, your relationship is not broken, but your fellowship is broken. Relationship is not broken. You're still a child of God. God is still your father, but fellowship is broken because sin puts a wall, a barrier between you and God confessing it and renouncing it removes the barrier relationship and fellowship are not the same. Just like when you're married, if you say something or do something that hurts your spouse, your marriage remains, you're still married. Relationship is still there, but fellowship can be broken. You can lose fellowship with your spouse, even though you're still married to your spouse. That's the same as when you sin, your fellowship with the father, the son, and with one another is broken, even though your relationship, you're still a child of God, still remains. Now, number four, I want to go on. Con- proofs that confession of sin in First John 1, 9 is for Christians. Look at this. Confession of sin is not the role of sinners. It is not for a sinner to confess their sins. It is not the duty or the obligation of a sinner to confess their sins. Now we're talking about someone not born again, not saved, not redeemed. Sinners are not called to confess their sins to God. They are called to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Now they do admit that they are a sinner, but their confession is Jesus is Lord. Romans 10 Verses 9 and 10, Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. It is not the responsibility of a sinner, an unbeliever, someone not born again, to confess their sins. The first thing they have to do is confess Jesus is Lord. In other words, they come and surrender their life to God, acknowledging they do acknowledge that they are sinful. They need a savior, 
but they acknowledge Jesus is their savior. They acknowledge they take Jesus as Lord of their life. Jesus is Lord. They declare and confess faith in Jesus Christ, the son of God, the one and only redeemer. You see, there's other religions that believe in God. But they don't believe Jesus is the son of God. And they don't believe that there's only one way to salvation through Jesus Christ. So to be born again, you must confess Jesus is the son of God. God raised him from the dead. And he is now Lord of your life. You submit and surrender to him. Then you're born again. That is what is expected and required of a sinner and unbeliever. They must confess Jesus is Lord. They confess their faith in Jesus. Then notice that the Bible teaches that confession of sin is the role of the priest. Look at Leviticus 16, 21, Leviticus 16, 21. This is the day of atonement on the day of atonement. They bring two goats or the scapegoat. And in verse 21, Leviticus 16, 21, the high priest lays both hands on the head of the live goat and he shall confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, confess all their sins and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert. Now notice it's the role of the high priest or the priests to confess the sin. But in the New Testament, as children of God, we are all priests. That's why you don't need somebody else to confess your sin. You do it. You do it. Because you are a priest. Revelation 1, 6. Revelation 1, 6. He has made us kings and priests unto God. And his father revelation five ten, and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. First Peter two nine first Peter two nine. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. We are all priests. That's why nobody else needs to confess your sin for you. You do it. You I'm talking to you today. You do it. You confess your sin because you are a priest. If you're born again, you confess your own sins unto God. But a sinner, an unbeliever, they're not a priest. They need to first confess Jesus as Lord, surrender their life. And then we as believers are those who confess sins because we are all priests. It is our own role. It is our role to confess our own sins. Now, let me go on another proof. Number five, if you're keeping track with me, this is on my list. Number five today. If a Christian is never supposed to confess sin, then why does the Bible teach many times that we should examine ourselves? The Bible teaches in the New Testament I'm talking about. The New Testament teaches that we should examine ourselves. Well, if there is no confession, then there should be no need for self-examination. If we are not supposed to confess sin, there's no purpose for examining ourselves. The purpose for self-examination is to look for sin. So if the Bible teaches we should examine ourselves then there's a reason for examining yourself so that you can confess sin. Do you get it? If we don't confess, then there's no need or purpose for self-examination. Now notice where you are supposed to examine yourself. You examine yourself for one, when you give your, when you give your offerings, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and 
offer your gift. In other words, if you're trying to sow special seed, and we talk about sowing seed, and you're, and, and you're giving a gift, this is like a, a special gift, an offering to the Lord, but you know that there is something between you and another person, you can also say between you and God, then you must first get rid of it. Clear yourself first before you try to give an offering, a special offering to the Lord and say, I'm, I'm sowing the seed today because I'm believing you father for this harvest. I'm believing you for my, my rent to be paid. I'm believing you for a job. I'm believing you Lord to bring breakthrough in my family. I'm giving you a special gift. Don't give God any offerings or gifts. If you have sin that you know of. Now we'll get to that again later. Also, it's sin that you know of sin that you're aware of when you know there's something between you and God or between you and another person. Then also examine yourself when you receive communion. First Corinthians 11 verses 27 and 28. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner this is communion, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Why? So that there is not no break in fellowship with the Father, the Son, and with each other. Examine yourself. What are you examining yourself for? Known sins. Known sins. Examine yourself before you receive communion. Well, if you're not supposed to confess your sin, then there would be no reason to examine yourself. Also, then examine yourself when you pray the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is in Mark 11, 24. And then in 25, it says, examine yourself. Basically, in other words, different words. Mark 11, 24. Therefore, I tell you, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. This is what we call the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith. You can go back to my teaching last November, December. I talked about the prayer of faith. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Verse 25 And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Notice that your sins are not automatically forgiven. You see, the part of that teaching of first John one nine is not for Christians is that they assume your sins are automatically forgiven. No, they're not automatically forgiven. Not the known sins. Not the sins you know about. Not the sins you're aware of. These you must forgive and and then ask forgiveness of so that your father may forgive you. It's not going to be automatic. You don't automatically receive forgiveness of sins. And we see here, if you don't forgive others, your sins will not be forgiven. And Jesus is not talking to the sinners. He's talking to the believers. Believers again should confess their sins. Notice what kind of, this is a unforgiveness in the heart. Heart sins. There's unforgiveness. There's also bitterness. There's resentment. There is anger, strife and division. And you can go on and just, you know, go on in that list Sins of the heart can hinder your faith. In other words, he talked in verse 24 about believing you receive when you pray. But in verse 25, he talked about things that will stop your faith. Stop your prayers from being answered. Heart sins will hinder your faith, which will stop your faith from producing results. Or you can say will hinder your prayers from. From being answered. So if you don't examine yourself to find sins that you know of, and again, I'm saying what you know about, these things that you know of will stop your prayers from being answered. Stop 
from getting results so that when you ask for healing, it doesn't come. When you ask for money to pay your bills, it doesn't come. Lack of confession of sin will stop prayers from getting answered it because it will stop your faith. So we have to examine ourselves when we pray the prayer of faith so that there is not a known sin that will block our faith. Now I'm saying the sins that you know about. If you're, if you listen carefully, if you have to search hard to find something wrong, then you haven't done anything wrong. The sins you are held accountable for are the sins you know. The sins you are held accountable for are the sins you know. And I'm going to get to that again in a moment. But when you're trying to search and you examine like, well, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong? If you can't find anything, if you, if there's not something that just pops to your mind, immediately, then there's nothing there. This we're talking about sins that the Holy Spirit has brought the light on. The Holy Spirit has shined the light and you have the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your heart for doing wrong. That's the sin we're talking about. But if you can't think of anything, then there's nothing there against you. Now, The last point on proofs, I want to point out the reason why we must confess and repent of sin is because ignoring sin hardens your heart. So we talked about earlier, hardens your heart. As it said in Proverbs 28, 13, uh, 28, 14, he who hardens his heart falls in trouble. Ignoring sin hardens your heart and makes you insensitive to the Holy Spirit's leadings and convictions. So do not harden your heart. If you ignore it, you harden yourself. You are hardening yourself when you ignore sin. First Timothy, first Timothy four verses one and two. The spirit clearly says that in later times, son, Some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron, seared as with a hot iron. So the searing is a desensitizing. You know, when you burn yourself really bad, then you lose the nerves, lose feeling, no feeling. No feeling in the nerves. Then you don't feel anything. You're no longer sensitive. And if you harden your heart, your conscience will be seared as with a hot iron. And God says again and again, Hebrews 3, 7 and 8. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Chapter 3, Hebrews three fifteen. as just has been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Hebrews 4, 7, as was said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. What is voice is he talking about? He's especially talking about conviction. Conviction, when the Holy Spirit draws you, when the Holy Spirit woos you, and when the Holy Spirit says you've done wrong, you, when the Holy Spirit shines the light in your heart on things that you've done wrong, do not harden your hearts, but repent, repent. The Holy Spirit brings conviction when we sin. And when we feel the conviction, it is time for us to confess and repent. If we keep ignoring the convictions of the Holy Spirit, our consciences will become seared as with a hot iron and we will become so hardened that, and we will, that we will lose all feeling, no longer feeling any convictions of the Holy Spirit. Then we are in a very, very dangerous place. Because when you no longer feel conviction for sin, remorse, godly sorrow 
for sin. You have become so hard and so seared that you don't feel anything when you sin or even when you see sin, you don't feel any remorse or notice or have the conviction then that you are in a very dangerous position because then sin begins to have free rule. Sin begins to have free rule in your lives when you, when you're in your life, when you no longer feel conviction. If it, if it has free rule in your life, it will go unchecked. It will go unchecked and begin to rule and run rampant in your life. It will take over your life. Sin will take over your life. That is how people who used to walk so close to the Lord, they ignored conviction and now they're living in the vilest places of sin because they ignored the convictions until they lost 100% feeling conviction from the Holy spirit is desired should be desired and it should be then following conviction. You should confess and repent confession and repentance is to curb sin and overcome sin in your life. Repent to overcome sin. Now, again, we are out of time. So join me again tomorrow. Remember, God loves you. You are blessed and highly favored by the Lord.